So that's why you can see why you might want to, in animals that change their diet radically through time, that's why you might want to split some of that out. So you can lump to a point, so you can say, right, they both, they're both penguins, they both eat fish, you know, so we can lump them together. At, a, at some point though, you have to start emitting them. If you overlump things, you can create a lot of artifacts that aren't teaching you anything. So if you lump all penguins in Antarctica together, there's such a diversity of diets behind them and life histories that you'd actually get an artifact. You wouldn't get a penguin. So sometimes franken sharks, like some Michael's post, poster works, those particular sharks all eat basically the same thing. It works. One of the biggest sins of the original ecoplasm models was that they lumped all invertebrates together. They'd have three different kinds of killer whale, the ones that came near people, the ones that lived near rocks, the ones that lived in open land, and then they'd have all benthic invertebrates stuck in one group. You've got to sort of break that habit. You've got to try and think about all parts of the system in the same, on the same level of resolution. So it's actually can't just be based on data though. If you know that something has a critical role in the system but no one's ever bothered to collect the information on it, you can't necessarily just leave it out. And again, the Southern Ocean is a good example of that. So I was involved in a bit of a, a modelling attempt about 15 years ago in Antarctica. And sitting in the room, it's one of those lovely political arenas of Kamalawa where they've all got the political hat as well as the science hat on. In the General Assembly, they didn't want to talk about anything but krill. And I asked, what happens when the krill's not there? And the Russian salutes over, jellyfish, salps. So I said, what about salps? And I said, oh, no one believes that by the Russians. And they wouldn't fit them. So it's actually, there was a bifurcation. You could get really different system states. Even today, there's not a lot of information collected on salps or fish or squid in the Southern Ocean as yet. Probably because it's so bloody hard to go down there. But we know that they have an, an important alternative role. So if you don't include them, you have to be conscious about the limitations you're putting on your model. Sometimes it's better to say, I'm really uncertain, and we're just going to give an impromptu lecture on uncertainty tomorrow. It's better to sometimes say, I'm really uncertain, but it could be like this, and just explore what that could be looks like, rather than to say, no, no, we have to be very sure. And that's particularly in climate change. You'll see people go, it's all of these different factors from the social or the economic side, but they're too hard to model, so we'll leave them out. When you start to play with some of these models, you can't afford to do that. You do have to be upfront about um, the uncertainties you have. And one of the uncertainties is what Carl Walters, who also helped write this program, calls the vampire in the basement. So I don't know how many of you watched the really crappy 1980s horror movies, but typically something would come out of the basement and get you unexpectedly. And that's his idea of it's what you left out of the model that will be the thing that proves to be important in the future. So it's the vampire in the basement that comes out of the moment. You have to be aware of that. That means you've got to try multiple different kinds of models. And then something that's pretty easy to use, like EcoPath or a qualitative model that Ingrid will tell you about later. Every time you come, you can't do this forever because you obviously get you know, explosion of dimensionality. But pretty much what I try to do is, for the first couple of classes at least, every time I come for a critical assumption, I try to keep both of them. What if it was this, or what if it was that? So I'm going to get the quote wrong, but one of, the, one of my lecturers gave this big fancy quote of someone important, and basically the guy said, every time you choose to put something in a model, you've chosen not to put in 10,000 other things. You need to be a bit conscious of that decisions you're making when you're putting, particularly one of these kind of models here. Um, so top predators are really important to have in there. They do tend to constrain what's coming down. But getting back to that the lake idea that we heard about the other day where you could tell how, what the parameterization was going to be based on the politics. It wasn't so much the politics, but we did learn pretty early on, about 15 years ago, that the background of the model was important at that point. So we all then sort of collaboratively started to think about processes we all needed. What had happened was that Carl had come from a fisheries background. So he had lots of buffering effects for top-down forces. I'd come from a general marine biology maths background and was being mentored or helped by someone who was a plankton modeler. So I had lots of bottom-up compensating mechanisms. So when we compared the two models, it was being dictated by the background of the model. So my damped um, environmental effects that blew up every time we did it with fisheries, and this was vice versa. 
So that's why you have to think about what were the core principles. So that's why we sat down and rethought really the whole process. And there started to be, if you look at all the different models from the different backgrounds over the last 10 to 15 years, they're converging on a common set of processes. They don't have a common structure or a common approach. They do have a common set of processes that do seem to be the fundamental processes that drive ecosystems. Part of that is the age structure stuff. Okay, so if we start to look at what some of the interface looks like. So when you're first setting up an ecopath model, um, I don't know how many of you can read that, but this is the model we're actually playing with. I learned pretty early on when I was giving this class that people would get really upset about the ecology of the animals. They would focus on whether the urchins should really be doing that with the lobster. So now we play with mermaids. So we have, we have the old wise mermaids, the uncontrollable teenage mermaids, the ankle biter mermaids. So in Australia, an ankle biter is a kid under about the age of five. Then we have jaws, as in the big sharks. We've had six fatal shark attacks in Australia in the last 10 months, so jaws seem somehow appropriate. We have the big fishies, the flying fishies, because I think they're cute. The bottom grunge dweller, so a bit like the blob fish that we saw this morning. The little fishies, the jellies, the wrinkly worms, the little floaty crunchy things, which are so plenty. <laughs> the green stuff, which is the photoplastic, and then the cracked and dead stuff. <laughs> so we actually also have a Lord of the Rings version that my children wrote once they were very bored and I was driving them on holiday. <laughs> oh, there's a one that has virgins and forests and unicorns, I think. <laughs> but basically, you um, <clears throat> when you're defining a group, you have to say what colour you want it to be on any plots that it spits out. That's kind of incidental. Whether it's a consumer, you can see how easy it is to fill this in. It's just a set of Tick, tick, tick. So is it a consumer, is it a producer, is it a trial? And then it fills in these for you. If you've got multi stanzas, you want to say how long that stanza lasts. So these end quiters start at their week, what they get born into. After 12 months, they become teenagers, and after 24 months, they become wise aged mermaids. So I think mermaids are pretty short with animals. <laughs> so for each group, you have to give it its name and all that kind of stuff. So you can fail it quite heavily with what you what you want out of it. These are the basic kinds of data and the units that you want them in. So you've got the biomass of the group in the area that you're worried about. It's kind of production and biomass ratio, so I'll explain a little bit of how you can get these data in a minute. The consumption on biomass, it's ecotropic efficiency, which you should really let eco part solve for. The diets of the animals in proportion, so you just need proportion by weight of the diet. The landing, so that's the actual catch that comes out of the ocean and ends up in the port. And then you've got the discards. So one of the terminology things that could trip you up is that when a fisheries person says catch, they actually mean what gets to the port plus the bits that they yanked out and then killed and then threw over the port. Okay? That's the total thing is catch. Landings is what gets to the port. And then they don't use it consistently, so sometimes catch is landing. So but basically, this is the basic data entry sheet, and this is why it's so easy to use, but it's so easy to misuse, because it is so simple to get going. That's why you have to be your own judge. So basically, you can say whether it lives in a whole area, so for argument's sake, I'll just suggest they can. There's another little interface for entering stuff to do with stanzas, but pretty much what you do is you just literally type in how much biomass is there, what's the production and consumption. And then you run a simulated rate, basically. And then how much the dryness is flowing in from outside the system. So in places like seamounts, where you've got a big flux coming past, you need to flow and things like that. Okay. So basically the other thing is if you see a, a cell with a little set of actions in the corner, that means there's a comment. You have to come down to the remark section to see what the comment is. So this is, it became our habit quite early on and something that really quite likes you to do is not just to keep a log on a piece of paper but to write into the model itself where you got the data from. What have you done to get that thing to balance? Now keep a log yourself that's easy to access. It gives you information about the model. So you also don't necessarily you have to be careful about how you define because it's a mass balance one. You won't get all data from one period of time. But you shouldn't try to overstuff it. So you've got a 
climax one series from say a troll survey or something that looks like this. This is actually, you should have three models. One for this period, one for that period, and one for that period. At least for EcoPath. You can try and join it by running through time with EcoSync, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if you're just having EcoPath, you need to be careful about how much you want to use. Because it's likely that the ecosystem was behaving differently over here. Or even here. Okay, so if you think about production by mass, there's a, another really smart guy that works with Rashid called Daniel Pauly, and he spent ages, ages of time in very hot countries collecting lots of fish so that he could come up with really useful equations like this one. So obviously what you try to do is you try to get the best, best data on the species of interest in the spot that you are. But like I said, for most fish in the sea, you're not going to have that. So you try and look for a species in the same system, or the same species in a different system. But if all of that fails, there's a whole bunch of really useful first estimates, basically. So they'll be uncertain, but pretty much this kind of rule applies. So this is sort of the, the size of the animal, the temperature of the animal, and the kind of what they were left with. It's probably the longer the length of growth curve. So basically, they're fairly easy things to get at the system level. Yeah, the natural mortality estimate. And then what P on B actually represents is if the total production or biomass is something that's supposed to be mass conserved, you just kind of equal your total mortality. So you have your natural mortality plus your fishing mortality will equal that. There's a couple other relationships that you can also grab from people who have equally many fish but in cold places typically. But you can use those rules of thumb when you get stuck. One of the places that you spend most of your time worrying about is consumption. So this is a, it's a bit dark, but there's a shark about to eat the fish there. So you can either try and collect this information in the field, which is quite hard, or as Billy chuckles and says, you can spend 10 years in the lab, ha ha ha. But it's actually something that's pretty hard to get. So again, you have to be a bit sensible. You can literally spend five years in the lab, or you can just think about what makes sense. So you sort of have your chain, this is the average growth, this is their average mortality, this leads you to that kind of biomass curve, we know the most food consumption from physiology studies, so that means it's kind of like this. So you do, that's why it's good to keep multiple versions of the model going. Because one of the, probably the biggest weaknesses of any end-to-end -end model is the level of uncertainty you have. Okay? It's going to be huge, so try and keep different versions going. So that you've got a bit of an eclectic nature in the code of things. You're not sort of <coughs> believer in one model that happens to be highly <coughs> Again, thinking to some of the work that Daniel's done, in fish that are symmetrical, so you can see if you're cutting down the bill, it sort of looks the same as the top and the bottom part. Um, there's rules. The, the faster the fish swims, the more that eats, because it actually has red flesh, not white flesh. So the ratio of the tail, so this aspect ratio is actually a pretty good correlative with the, uh, its consumption rate. So it's another little rule of thumb if you get really stuck. So you wouldn't use this for every species in every model. But when you get stuck, it's kind of the rules of thumb are useful. But you do have to be quite careful of when you can't use it. So if anything that doesn't have a symmetrical tail, so the shark, they have a really big upper lobe and a little lower lobe, or eels, so they kind of don't have the tail, they are on the tail, you can't use them. But we can use them, they can prove to be pretty good. So we think about diets in EcoPath, basically it's just the proportion. So all the different entries of what it eats has to sum up to one. Now there's one extra thing that you can slot in here, the import, and that's food that comes in from outside the system. So you might have something like a seagull that eats out of the land. So seagulls in Tasmania have an obesity problem. <laughs> because the people have no obesity problems. The rubbish that we throw out is fatty and greasy, so the seagulls eat it and they get fatty and greasy as well. We have the most, world's most overweight seagull, according to a recent report. Um, but that's the kind of place where you can put that kind of stuff in. Well, another one is if you've got something like the whales we heard about this morning, where they come up to the tropics to have their calves that they eat in the southern ocean. So they can't eat anything inside the model domain if you're only looking at the tropics. So that's where you put that kind of stuff in. Um, the other thing you typically have is that you have, will have lump lots of things together. 
So you have to be smart about how you do your averages. So you can have weighted averages, for instance. This is actually why.